Hello, my name is Ipin, and for the next 30 minutes, I am going to touch on the working and high aspects of design for safety from the perspective of an end user. Now, why from end user's point of view? Because I am sure that we all agree that we need to design with the end user in mind. For the simple fact that the end users are the ones that designers are trying to protect. In this case, from getting killed from falling from heights. To start off, let's take a quick look at responsibilities of designers as stated in the Workplace Safety and Health Council's WSHC's Guidelines on Design for Safety in Buildings and Structures. Designers are expected to consider how buildings or structures can be constructed, cleaned, maintained, and decommissioned or demolished safely in their design. For this presentation, due to the time constraint, let's focus only on some of the expectations for maintenance and cleaning. By designing safe permanent access and specifically to the roof, and safe temporary access to allow for painting and maintenance of facades. In the guide process outlined in the WSHC guidelines, the second phase of the design review studies the risks related to the maintenance and repair of the building. Again, due to limited time, we will only look at some design considerations for edge protection and anchor points. And now, we can establish the basis of the sharing. We are going to assume that working at height is required, that is, elimination or substitution of working at height in the hierarchy of control measures has been evaluated by designers and deemed unavoidable, and working at height in the context of cleaning and maintenance activities. There will be a heavy emphasis on fall protection and prevention systems because that's what end users mostly use when they have no alternative means but to work at height. And by approaching this topic from the perspective of an end user, I hope that at the end of the session, we can bring back some design considerations and implications not normally found in textbooks. Buildings are getting more prestigious in appearance and are often highly adventurous in their architectural form. But all roofing systems require cleaning, such as periodic removal of leaves and debris from the roof gutters, inspection of the flashing, roof lights, etc., maintenance, an essential requirement to uphold the warranties, and repair, such as glass replacement or replacement of cladding panels. In this case study of a real life job, we will require to replace cladding panels on a sloped roof and line the roof gutter with waterproof membrane. Please pardon the rudimentary sketch. The roof slopes downwards towards the apex here. The gutter is indicated by this dotted line. And access is by this hatch here. When we did the initial site visit for our risk assessment and to plan the work procedures, we were very glad to see that there were permanent anchor posts provided for temporary lifelines. Ten years ago, when I first started in fall protection and working at height, we will be lucky to find something solid enough to secure our lifelines. So there is design for safety considered, but is it sufficient to protect end users? The challenge we faced then on this job was actually safe access. How are we going to move upwards on the inclined roof from the roof hatch point X here to point A, almost 10 meters away safely? Remember the anchors are permanent, but the lifelines are not. We have to set it up ourselves. And in the meantime, we are totally exposed to slipping off the roof and falling splat on the ground 20 floors below. And also, moving from point A to B to C and so on, how can we be protected from falling to our depths over the lip of the roof here? Normally, we can use twin lanyards to move from point to point safely as shown in this diagram. We hook on one anchor. We unhook from another and hook on to the next, always remaining attached to at least one anchor point while moving from point to point. However, in this case study, the anchor posts were located too far apart for this very widely used method. We found that they were designed and positioned as such for rope access or vertical lifelines in mind to provide maximum coverage over the entire roof surface, which is good. Less anchor posts, less cost. However, as an end user, I would also like to have some safety provisions while setting up these temporary lifelines and not to forget when dismantling them after the job is completed. Next, let's look at the roof hatch. This is the actual photo of the roof hatch and you can see one anchor post down by the corner. Looking down into the roof hatch in the next photo, 
We can see that the way up to this roof edge is by climbing through the space frames. It was hard work to move through the space frames using the twin lanyard method for our safety and to maneuver our equipment through it. Imagine trying to pass cladding panels through this maze and through the roof hatch. More can be done to design and provide for safe access to the roof for end users and their tools and equipment. In fact, although I have personally not seen it here in Singapore, having guardrails and self closing gates at the roof hatch can protect end users from falling through it, especially when they are standing there passing tools equipment and material. All it takes is a misstep to fall through the hatch and injure themselves, like in this video. For those who have seen this video before, just bear with me for a while. So what do you think happened to this lady? Case study 2 Here we have another roof surface. Unlike the previous case study, we have an anchorage bar running along the top of the roof for fall protection and rope access. From the end user's perspective, anchorage bars are much more convenient. Unlike anchor points, they provide for continuous anchorage. I can hook up and slide along the anchorage bar to move. This means relatively less hooking and unhooking my lanyard or lifeline. Less hassle also means more likely that it will be used. And we will not have the issue of with anchor poles being too far apart as in the previous case study. This is good for us. However, often we are unsure of how many persons we can put on the anchorage bar safely. Unlike an EN795 certified iBoat, which we know is usually for one person, with anchorage bars, it is hard for us to tell. Signages are supposed to be displayed indicating the number of persons allowed, just like for scaffolding. The inspection date, the next maintenance and inspection, we'll talk about the provisions for maintenance and inspection later. This applies to permanent lifelines as well as anchor eye boats as shown in the pictures. This information will help the end users in planning their safe work procedures and will be greatly appreciated. Next, how are we going to access the rooftop? There is no roof hatch, and access was supposed to be from inside the louvers, out through an access door here. Then, using the anchor poles along the side here to climb onto the roof, hard work, but not doable. Sorry, hard work, not an ideal access, but doable. The challenge was, how are we going to get up the access door in the loose? Based on the drawings, there were supposed to be ladders, but when we were there, they were not installed. Okay, a quick recap of the previous two case studies. First, there is a difference between designing for safe access and designing for the work at height activity itself. Second, the design needs to accommodate the tools, equipment required for the anticipated cleaning and maintenance tasks to allow the end users to access and ingress safely with them. Also, the fall protection equipment used by the end users needs to be considered. For example, are they using a 1 meter lanyard or 2 meter lanyard? Third, the fall protection systems, number of anchor points provided, should be sufficient for the number of end users required to complete their task within the given time frame. For example, if the owner requires that the external facade cleaning is to be completed within 3 weeks, then the design needs to cater for the number of end users required to do so or else the job cannot be completed on time and the owner will not be happy. And to put up a signage to inform the end users so that we do not unknowingly overload the system. A horizontal lifeline serves as an extended long anchorage for one or more users with personal fall arrest systems. It is increasingly becoming more common in Singapore, so we are going to spend some time on this. Once the system is installed, End users are at the mercy of the design. There are certain inherent risks in its configuration and placement, and end users can only do very little to mitigate them. In this example, access to the roof of the main building is by the roof hatch here. The horizontal lifeline 1 is positioned as such to provide safe access along the edge. What is the potential hazard here should the end user fall along this section here? 
With the diffraction of lifeline, the end user might hit the roof of the adjacent annex, as shown in this diagram. If the end user falls here, then there is sufficient current side for him to fall and not hit against another surface. So we only have to worry about rescuing the end user after the fall. Next, on the annex rooftop, access is by the door here. near the roof edge and we have a few configurations for discussion. Horizontal lifeline 2 is positioned on the wall. For the end user to reach the roof edge here, a long lifeline is necessary. If he falls here, then he will swing back and hit against the wall or even the ground if the annex is not high enough. Horizontal lifeline 3 is configured as a straight line and position in the middle of the roof. Similarly, for an end user to reach this corner here, a long lifeline is necessary, and should he fall, there's a potential hazard of swing back or swing down. Horizontal lifeline 4 probably costs more than the other two. It runs along the parameter of the roof and provides for an end user to hook on once he enters through the door. For this configuration and positioning, using a 2 meter lanyard is sufficient and minimizes the swing back or swing down in a fall. So it is not so simple as just putting a horizontal lifeline there. A risk assessment should be conducted, taking into consideration the surrounding structures and clearance height required to determine the safest configuration and positioning. Some considerations when deciding to use horizontal lifelines. The clearance height required. In the previous example, a fall on horizontal lifeline 1 may result in an end user hitting the adjacent roof. Designers may want to consider using a rigid horizontal lifeline with less deflection to mitigate this or to reduce the span by increasing the number of intermediate anchors. The maximum rest force or MAF on the end user and its implication on the strength requirements of the system components, the anchorages and the supporting structure has to be understood. A balance has to be struck between minimizing the maximum rest force and reducing clearance height. To reduce maximum rest force and hence minimize the damage to the roof may mean increasing the deflection to absorb the energy. But this will lead to higher clearance height required to fall safely and a higher risk of the end user hitting against an object. So what kind of forces are we talking about? In a very simplistic view for the illustration purpose, an EN355 energy absorber is designed to reduce the maximum rest force to 100 kg end user to a maximum of 6 kN in the fall. Assuming a flexible horizontal lifeline with 10 meter span deflects by this much as shown in this diagram, resolving the vectors will really give more than 11 kN force and the end terminations. Again, I stress that this is not the correct calculation method for horizontal lifelines. It is actually much more complicated and the impact forces generated may be even higher. It is simplified so that we can understand that a person falling can generate an impact load many times his weight. In several Canadian and American jurisdictions, a professional engineer is required to approve the designs and installations of horizontal lifelines. Pre-engineered horizontal lifeline, including on performance, design, testing, and labeling, are covered by the Canadian Standards Association's Z259.13-04 Flexible Horizontal Lifeline System Standards. Custom designed on-site built horizontal lifelines are covered by Z259.16-04 Design of Active Fall Protection Systems. This is the formula for maximum arrest force. You can use this to calculate the maximum arrest force to the end user when he is falling on a vertical lifeline or lanyard. But again, I stress, this is not for horizontal lifeline systems. To get a visual on the maximum arrest force that we need to consider, I'm going to show a short video clip. In this demonstration, we dropped a 220 pound mannequin, only 6 feet. When the mannequin hits the bottom of its 6 foot drop, you can see the violent forces at work. Now, 
Look at the difference when you incorporate a shock-absorbing lanyard. The forces on your body have dropped from almost 5,000 pounds to less than 900. This is why the European American standards require the anchorage strengths as stated in this table. The European standards require the four arrest anchor for each individual to be able to hold 10 kN for 3 minutes. The American standards require it to be 22 kN. That said, it is in our experience that engineers and designers often underestimate the impact loads generated in a fall, and hence the strength required of anchors in a fall arrest system. It is not unusual to see engineers applying a safety factor of 2 for a static load of a 100 kg worker without consideration the dynamic amplification in the fall. This works out to about 2 kN. This is grossly below the strength of anchors required by both the European and American standards. And since uh, roof access, also known as abseiling, Spider-Man, etc., is also becoming more widely used, we should also take note that the code of practice for rope access requires anchorage strength of 15 kN, higher than that for four rest anchors. Case study 3. Covered walkways are a common site in Singapore, and they have to be cleaned regularly of algae and debris. In this photo, the end users are wet cleaning the canopy. The surface is wet and slippery, which increases the probability of them slipping and falling, but they have nothing to hook on to and are not protected from falling. Yes, on their end, they may be able to do the job using a mobile elevator work platform, such as a scissors lift, but on the design side, what can be provided for them? One suggestion can be to retrofit the Horton lifeline as indicated by the red line in the photo. Whether it should be a flexible or rigid one has to be an outcome from evaluating the clearance height and the maximum arrest force on the worker. But most importantly, can the structure support the load? Another quick recap before we move on to the last part. When designing for fall protection systems, Architects and consultants need to cater for the dynamic impact forces on structures and anchors, which can be many times the width of the end user, and design the supporting structures to be sufficiently strong for retrofitting fall protection systems. Sometimes it is only later that we discover that certain areas require fall protection, and it is so much easier if there are supporting structures strong enough as anchors for end users to set up temporary fall protection or for installers to retrofit permanent solutions. We will cover provisions for rescue and uh, replacement and translating design to reality shortly. As a result of technological advances in fall protection, effective mitigation of fall hazards no longer is such a far-fetched goal. Fall rest systems can be fixed to all major composite built out on site, standing seam, secret fix and membrane roofing. Depending on the nature of the roofing systems, poles can be fixed by means of stitching screws split clamps, reverts, toggle boots, or mechanical anchors. This photo shows some examples. There is no need to fix through the roof or attach to the structure steel or purlins. Importantly, this top fixing process ensures that the function of the building is not compromised during installation. In this photo, you can see this gutter that needs to be inspected and maintained. Fall protection was provided by installing foldable guardrails onto the Cowsit roofing sheets using the S5 adapter from Cowsit. When the end user needs access to the gutter, they push it up and they are protected from falling off the edge. When they are done, they fold it down and the architect is happy that the guardrails cannot be seen from below. So a variety of uh, anchorage solutions can be utilized by the end user, provided that the supporting structure is sufficiently strong to take the load. Another example is this 318 meter expired tower in Doha. I was there as a consultant to help out the work method for external cleaning. There, almost everything is covered in a perpetual layer of sand, and the owner wanted the tower clean as often as possible so that the guests can look out the window and enjoy a nice view instead of a layer of sand. So how many cleaners do you think is required to clean this building and how to do it safely? In their design, they incorporated ladder access and horizontal lifelines. 
In this photo, you can see right at the top, they have this ladder that, that moves horizontally along this track around the structure. So the cleaners can move vertically up and down the ladder as well as horizontally across by rolling the ladder along the track. Fall protection was provided by incorporating a safety rail into the ladder style where cleaners can attach their fall raster device. This concept is deployed along the height of the tower. For example, to clean the 10 to 12 story, there is a catwalk running around the perimeter of the 10th floor to provide access to the ladder which is from 10 to 12th floor. Fall protection while walking on the catwalk is by means of a horizontal lifeline around the whole perimeter. By having several rings or bands of catwalks and access ladders around the tower, multiple crews can be deployed simultaneously for faster cleaning. At the same time, the end user is protected while moving horizontally and vertically. New buildings and structures are better designed for safety, but there are still a lot of existing buildings around. End users cleaning and maintaining these existing buildings and structures are exposed to falling hazards as seen in these photos. Even for those setting up the safe access, such as the suspended scaffold erectors uh, in the middle photo, they are not protected. Can there be an anchor point in stock for them so that they can attach a lanyard? And can this same anchor point also be used to anchor the independent lifeline for the suspended scaffold users? I leave it to you as a little exercise to think about. So the lesson learned, an independent lifeline is life-saving. But what's next after the fall? This is a newspaper clipping for 18 August 2009 in Brooklyn, where a worker fell four stories to his death when the scaffold collapsed. Two workers were left dangling. The Workplace Safety and Health Act Section 12, Clause 3D requires employers to develop procedures for emergencies. The Code of Practice on Working Safely at Height also requires a written height rescue plan. So legally and morally, we need to plan for what happens should a person falls and is hanging in mid-air like in this photo. One key consideration in planning a height rescue is ensuring the safety of the rescuer. A height rescue is not as simple as it seems and it is always, always dangerous. One of the greatest challenge is finding an anchor point for the rescuer and the rescue kit. More can be done in the design for rescue operations. Lastly, in order for the safe design to be effective, its intended usage must be communicated. Personally, I think there is a breakdown in communication between the design team, builder, and the facility management when handing over. Often, when contracted for jobs, the facility management are unable to advise us, the end users, on the safety provisions for work at height. No doubt, as contractors or end users, we are obligated to develop the safe work procedures, but we need to know the breaking strength of the anchors, the capacity of the system, the safe way to access the roof, the fault protection equipment intended for, etc. etc. These are critical information for end users in the risk assessment and to plan their work. Just like you have maintenance menus for vehicles and televisions, etc., building maintenance menus with instructions on a safe access will be very useful for end users. In conclusion, wear the shoes of the end user when reviewing building designs, solicit input from subject matter experts, including the end users themselves, and communicate it to the end users. Our ultimate aim is to reduce risk at source to the end users. Thank you.